Good evening and welcome. Thank you. It's, it's really good to be together again and to see so many friendly faces. I'm Michael Hendricks, Senior Fellow and Director of State and Local Policy here at the Manhattan Institute. And we are here for the 2021 James Q. Wilson Lecture with Ed Glazer. And uh, we honor the legacy of James Q. Wilson in this lecture every year, uh, not simply uh, because he was a close friend of the Institute or because of his profound contributions to the study of crime, sadly more relevant than ever, but that James Q. Wilson was one of the most influential scholars of the 20th century. He wrote in everything from the nature of bureaucracies to the life and behavior of coral reefs, and it was his broken windows theory of crime and law enforcement that from the early 80s onwards set in motion the crime reduction program to its thousands in this very city and across many major cities truly owe their lives. He'd be 90 years old this year, and for 15 of those years, he gave this lecture, a legacy that now lives on with Ed Glazer. Ed is a dear friend whose similarly wide-ranging scholarship has profoundly shaped our understanding of the urban environments where billions across the globe call home. And a seminal 2008 book, Triumph of the City, defined our urban moment over the past decade where, for the first time in history, more than half of the world's population lived in cities. And yet, for the past few years of this lecture, Ed's warned us. He's warned us that we can't take this urban miracle for granted. He's shown us how the lure of socialism and the power of insiders represent critical threats to urban opportunity. Many poor Americans have yet to experience fully the gifts of the urban renaissance that we've experienced over the past few years and decade. With COVID-19 and the rise of remote work, suddenly we are questioning the very survival of cities, which was indeed the subject of his last lecture with us. And now, the survival of the city is now Ed's latest book, written with co-author David Cutler, friend of his, fellow professor at Harvard. It's a fascinating story in everything from plague to robots and schooling, but most of all, it's a recognition and a warning that, to quote the very first line from the book, cities can die. Here in New York City, the pandemic brought death to our doorstep. Even as we've begun recovering and reopening, a barren midtown and lingering COVID fears show how even our greatest, our greatest urban challenges haven't gone away. And perhaps the greatest question before us is how can New York, and indeed really any great city, restore their promise as engines of opportunity? And it's a question that Ed answers directly in his latest book and to which he responds head on here in today's lecture. James Q. Wilson once said that he followed the facts wherever they land, and I can state for a fact that that's a spirit Ed brings here in gripping fashion today. And with that, Ed Glazer. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. The, um, you know, it is actually really true. He is really a very dear friend. And I, I sort of remember Michael when he was a very little uh, scholar of state and local government. And now it's been great to watch him become, uh, uh, become the really serious contributor to this, this topic that he is today. It is wonderful to be with you live. Life is just better lived in, in person. And uh, I am just thrilled to be back here giving uh, the James Q. Wilson lecture. Now, um, I will eventually get to it. It will take me a little bit of time. But the Wilson text that I'm taking for my lecture tonight is actually the book that uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan called his magnum opus, which is Bureaucracy Itself. And while very little of this lecture will actually deal with bureaucracy, it is actually the point, and we'll come to that at, at the end. But in fact, if I gave you 24 minutes on bureaucracy, it would really not be fair uh, at, at this point in time. Um, instead, I, I'm going to start uh, with plague. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about plague. And my point about plague is, is going to be that the impact of disease like the impact of any natural disaster, is mediated by the strength of civil society at the time that disease strikes. And the point, insofar as it relates to cities today, uh, is that New York and many of our cities are much weaker than they were 20 years ago when terrorists struck the Twin Towers. And that weakness means that we face dangers that we did not for much of the past 20 years. Now, I'm going to start with a, a pandemic with a disease that struck during a period that was not absolutely cat catastrophic, but it was pretty bad. Okay? Now, the backstory, of course, for the plague of Athens, which uh, strikes that city in 430, is, is that Athens is doing everything you could possibly ask a city to do in the 5th century BC. Right? It is creating chains of collaborative brilliance that are doing absolutely miraculous things in architecture, in sculpture, in drama, in philosophy, in math. Right? In history itself. 
And of course, the very success of the city, particularly its economic and military success, excites the envy of its you know, less urban, more military rival, Sparta. Right? Pericles, the leader of Athens, is not one to roll over in the face of, of Spartan hostility, and so the Peloponnesian War is on. Now, uh, the plan that, that Pericles has is to summon the Athenians and their Attic allies behind the walls of the city, trusting to those walls to keep out the Spartan hoplites, and then send the Peloponnesian fleet forth to harass the Peloponnesian coast. A perfectly sensible plan militarily. The hoplites do not breach the walls, but disease does. Athens, like New York in 2020, was a node on the global lattice of travel and trade. It is an entry point for goods, for people, and for disease. And so it was in 430 BCE. It is the first urban plague that we have that is well described because Thucydides was there. He describes a city that is run amok, a city in which people live entirely for the moment because they do not expect to see tomorrow. Perhaps one-fourth of Athens' population sold, dies during the fir first two years of the plague. Athens itself soldiers on for another quarter century in the Peloponnesian War before eventually losing. But the city's glory is forever dimmed, right? And it ceases to be the New York City of the metropolitan world, becoming perhaps its Boston, then maybe its Cambridge Mass. Uh, and it, it survives, but it survives as a shadow of what, of what it was. Now, for the next 500 years or so, the Mediterranean world is relatively pandemic free. You have to get until the second century CE where plague comes again and strikes the Roman Empire. Um, it's not clear if it might be measles, might be smallpox. No one's exactly sure, sure of this, but a pretty catastrophic event demographically. But the second century empire was strong. This is the era of the so-called four good emperors, and you know, Antoninus Pius is you know, followed by Marcus Aurelius, and they just skate on through. The institutions are strong. Third century, another one. Because in fact, Rome is connecting to the entire world. It's a bit of globalization in its entire era. right? And you get the Cyprian plague of the third century. The empire is weaker. There's been internal conflict. And this one's more debilitating. This is taken as being one of the, the events that then sort of leads towards the unraveling of the, the third century crisis and then eventually the collapse in the fifth century. But the sort of ultimate disaster occurs three more centuries later, right? 530, 530, BC, 530 AD, 541 AD, right? This is a period in which the fate of the Mediterranean really hangs on the edge of a knife. So remember, fifth century, you have Ostrogothic conquerors who have taken down Rome. Right? The Western Roman Empire is no more. But Rome persists. Its mightier half exists in the east. Right? And it's been waiting there. And the first generation of Ostrogoths, right, the Theodoric the Great, has been replaced by their decidedly less impressive children and much less impressive grandchildren. Right? And so Italy is vulnerable. And so Justinian sends forth his great warlord, and you can see Belisarius is the warlord who's next to Justinian, forth to conquer North Africa, which is the breadbasket of Rome, and then to reconquer Italy itself. And it really looks as if there's a chance that the Pax Romana is going to be reimposed on the Mediterranean world. It really looks as if a chance in which the urban civilization that Greece and then Rome had been would survive in Europe. And then at that moment, right, Yersinia Pestis, the Black Death, the bubonic plague, strikes Constantinople. Right? It's all over. It's all over. It keeps on coming decade after decade, even century after century. The, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire does not become a, a pacifier. They become yet another petty warlord bringing chaos to Italy and bringing chaos to, to Europe. Right? Europe plunges into centuries of darkness. This is the worst case scenario. And it occurred because plague hit at a time when uh, the Mediterranean was incredibly weak. And so we need to ask ourselves, are our cities feeling like second century Rome? Are we feeling like we are led by the uh, Hadrian's and Antoninus Piuses of our day? Or are we perhaps somewhere else in terms of the, the spectrum of, of urban strength? So uh, before COVID hit, it seemed to me that despite, you know, relative to my basis point, which is always New York, let's say, 1977. It always goes to like when you're 10 years old. And that's, that's always my benchmark. And New York always seems to be doing pretty well relative to New York 1977. So I always have sort of a kind of positive sense of where the city is. But certainly for much of the past decade, there has been a much more widespread discontent 
particularly on the left, with the way that our cities are, are functioning. And some of this is real, and some of it is, is other forms of unhappiness. But the real elements of it are that our cities are bringing productivity. They're bringing wage growth for adults. But the available evidence is that they're failing our kids. And I'll spend a fair amount of time on that. Um, Successful cities are becoming permanently unaffordable, so this has uh, been a steady theme of mine in terms of privileging insiders at the expense of outsiders, making it too difficult to build. And of course, the ultimate expression of privileging insiders over outsiders is rent control, right? Which means that if you are lucky enough to have gotten one of these apartments, then you get a great deal, not just for your life, but for multiple generations in your life, right? Of privileged insiders, whereas good luck finding you know, an outsider finding, because of course, rent control has made it less attractive to build new housing for people who don't already have it. Um, the shutting down of, of the metropolitan frontier, the closing of the metropolitan frontier because of this shutting down of opportunity to build and to open new businesses, right, has meant that we have locked millions of Americans in the underperforming inner eastern heartland of the U.S. And of course, I will, you know, one has to touch the, the actual, you know, protests during 2020 were over policing. Right? And so there's clearly a sense that policing has not done everything that people have wanted it to do. And I will, come, I will come back to that. And again, I stress from my perspective, it is an urban miracle that our cities are as safe as they are. And in fact, you know, at least prior to COVID, they were as safe as they were. And so that's, that, that at least is my starting point on this. But um, let me start with, this is um, data from the Opportunity Atlas of, assembled by Raj Chetty and his co-authors. Over here, you have the relationship between GDP per capita and population density. This is the well-familiar agglomerations are incredibly productive economically. And this is not just a static effect. This is the fact that when people come to cities, they experience faster wage growth year by year, month by month, because you know, cities are engines of human capital accumulation for adults. They do not seem to be similar engines for kids. Right? This is upward mobility. Um, so what this is, is it's, it takes a generation born between 78 and 83, so about 10 years younger than I am, 10 to, 10 to 15 years younger than I am, um, and then it looks at them 30 years later, looks at their earnings when they're about 30. And it focuses on children whose parents are poorer than 75% of Americans, and it asks, where did they end up in the income distribution as adults? And so what you can see, this is across metropolitan areas. The denser the metropolitan area, you go from the lower the level of upward mobility. So you go from being in the 45th uh, income percentile at the low levels down to the 40th. These are looking within metropolitan areas. So you can see here really like moderate density levels, there's no impact. But once you go to higher density levels, the upward mobility really uh, craters there from the 44th income percentile down to the 38th. And this is upward mobility with distance from the city center. So the city center would be, you know, uh, Grand Central Station in New York. So it's, the further you're going away, the higher your upward mobility is. Now, if you're wondering what the secret sauce behind this is, this really sort of shows it to you. This is the spatial break right at the edge of Central City School Districts. So this is averaging over all of America, and we've, we're looking right at the edge of the city. So what this says is if you grew up right outside of New York's school district, right, your upward mobility is about two and a half percentage point higher in the income distribution than if you were right inside. So right across the street, right, going to a, going to a different school district, two and a half percentage points on average. The other one shows your probability of being incarcerated as an adult, right, right at the edge of the central city school district. So, so that's, you know, you can even say that's one percent percentage point down, but, you know, the other way of saying it is from three percent down to two percent, that's a, you know, one third reduction in your probability of being in jail or prison as an adult right at the edge of the Central City School District. This is failure by any definition, right? This is a failure, and you know, I, I as a kid grew up in here, and clearly there are, you know, plenty of you did as well, and there, there are clearly plenty of people who emerge out of the cauldron of New York and do perfectly well. But on average, our cities are not doing well for their children. And if we try to understand why our cities are different for adults and kids, the cell phone data that we're now getting on mobility really seems to show it, right? That in fact, if you are an adult, and even if you, you, know, you, you grow up and you, you wake up in some lower income neighborhood in Queens, you then come to work in Manhattan, right? You're interacting with some of the wealthiest and you know, often best educated people in the world. If you're a poor kid growing up in a housing project, you then go from your segregated housing project to your segregated school. And you live a life that is almost as isolated as if you were in a rural village. None of the great advantages mixing that are you know, crucial to our, our, our cities are present there. The inequality 
of this, this element. And you know, I believe very strongly and, uh, that cities should never apologize for the inequality. Cities like New York have rich people because they're relatively pleasant places to be rich, and they have poor people because they're relatively less painful places to be poor. Right? This is something that cities do that's good, not something that cities do that, that is bad. Right? It was, of course, Plato in the Republic who wrote that every city would ever size in reality two cities, one a city of the rich, the other a city of the poor, and they're perpetually at war with one another. But of course, that inequality is only tolerable if cities are fulfilling their historic role of being escalators towards wealth for the poor. And there is at least some evidence to suggest that at least for kids, they're not doing that. The sense of inequality has only been exacerbated by COVID, right? Because in fact, this, this, you know, this pandemic was experienced very differently by the educated and the less educated. So this just shows at the height of teleworking, 68.9% of Americans with advanced degrees were working remotely, whereas only 5% of high school dropouts were working remotely. Only 15% of Americans with just a high school degree were working remotely. This was a very different experience. This explains why, in fact, COVID rates in New York were much lower in you know, New York, in, in Manhattan, and in Brooklyn than they were in the outer boroughs. This also tells you that, in fact, the mortality rates were totally different at different points of the income distribution, that this was a pandemic that killed the poor much more than it killed the rich. Um, this, is, this is crisis number two. This is our ha affordable housing crisis. Uh, this is just meant to show you along the horizontal axis is the amount of new construction. Along the vertical axis is the gap between housing prices and the marginal physical cost of, of uh, producing housing. So this three means it costs you three times as much to buy a house in San Francisco as to build a house in San Francisco. Okay? Um, and what this tells you is the familiar fact that places that build a lot aren't expensive and places that are expensive aren't build, aren't, don't build a lot. Right? New York built 100,000 units a year in the early 1920s when it stayed affordable despite huge demand. Right? There's no repealing the laws of supply and demand. The fact that New York and other cities have an affordability crisis is a self-imposed issue. It's reflecting our privileging insiders over outsiders. The fact that New York and San Francisco and Boston and Philadelphia don't build a lot helps to explain this. Right? This is what I have argued is America's largest unsolved social problem. The fact that for most of the past decade, more than 15% of prime age men have been jobless. Right? This is a state that is associated with a huge amount of misery because, in fact, one sense of well-being comes from a sense of purpose and comes from the social connections that come with a job, right? And the, the problem is that, in fact, as you look at this map, right, it's easy to imagine what a less well-educated New Yorker is going to do in 20 years. There will be jobs in the great urban service economy, the 32 million Americans who labored in leisure, hospitality, and retail trade. There will be these jobs you know, as far as we can imagine. But what are they going to do in West Virginia? What are they going to do in Appalachia, where there are not people who are actually willing to hire them in the, in the great urban service economy? And they are priced out of coming to New York or San Francisco. They're priced out of where the places where the jobs are. And so this has led to a huge mismatch between where America is productive and where people can, can live. And it's led to this dysfunction of permanent joblessness in parts of America. This just shows the relationship between the not working rate in 1980 and the not working rate in 2010. These are remarkably persistent areas. This is not an area in which you're temporarily seeing a blip. This is a 30-year pattern of enormous dysfunction. And of course, we have won a great triumph, a great triumph in terms of making our city safer. And James Q. Wilson played a significant role in that, right? for which the city should take a great deal of credit. But we've also done it by locking up a lot of people. Right? And we need to recognize that that's not a free thing. And that, in fact, much of, much of America thinks that this is not something that we did that was necessarily a, an unalloyed pro good. As we see in things like this is Columbus, Ohio, as we see in, in uh, pictures like this. Yet, all the progressive anger, which is fueled by real issues and not real issues, right, has to come up against the fact that it has never been easier for businesses to relocate from cities. There's no part of me that believes that you know, your smart, savvy tech company is going to say, oh, you know what, we'll just all dial it on from our Westchester homes. Right? That's not the future. But they may, in fact, say, you know, we don't need to have our tech company in New York. We can locate to Vail because we all like skiing. We can locate to Austin, Texas because we don't like paying income taxes. We can locate to Honolulu because we like surfing. Right? Everybody is more mobile than they have been in the past, even though face-to-face -face contact is still understood to be a, a tremendous asset. Right? That means that, in fact, any attempt to replay, right, to, to, to see progressive dreams imposed on this, means that talent will flee. And we risk 
going into you know, something like 1975 again. Again, I'm still stuck in, in, the, in the mid 1970s. But you know, we have seen this script before. We know what happens when progressive dreams collide with an era of increased mobility. That was the story of the 1970s. When highways made it easier for people to leave cities and move to suburbs, when container ships made it easier for manufacturing firms to leave urban areas. Right? And we ended up experiencing a city on the edge of bankruptcy. New York managed to survive. It's not entirely obvious that Cleveland and Detroit really did. Right? And they had exactly the same, the same dynamic. And so we need to do something right, that actually answers the, the, the angers and the need, but to do so in a way that doesn't make more problems. I, I will say that outside of New York, where this city does, in fact, as you all know, have a very significant personal income tax, most cities do not have the ability to raise their own income taxes. And so that type of targeting of the rich is not likely. However, we have all experienced a remarkable increase in crime during the last year. Right? We had the largest increase in murders ever in, in the last year. And so a significant increase in, in the lack of safety in cities seems to me like a very real risk and one that we need to take quite seriously. So the path forward, unfortunately, leads back to bureaucracy. Okay? And that's where James Q. Wilson comes in. Um, so we must do something. And we have an opportunity with the Adams administration uh, to actually offer things. This is, in some sense, an MI moment. Because it's a moment in which things must be done, but they must be smart. They must actually answer the needs of the day, but they must actually do so in a way that is sensible rather than fueled by, you know, fueled by, we all know what it's fueled by. Um, so um, uh, in past lectures, I've, I've discussed the Young's penchant for socialism, the need to build an agenda for outsiders. That's still true, but the pandemic has also proven that we actually need effective government. And that's what I mean by bureaucracy. We actually needed a government that was more effective at fighting pandemic. I mean, the idea that we spend as many trillions of dollars as we do on health care, and we ended up with this, right? This is an appalling indictment of the incompetence uh, of you know, our, our, our federal government. And we spend a whole chapter in the book talking about this, and I'm happy to answer it in questions. But you know, we didn't design an agency that was around fighting for health. We designed a system that was around printing money to pay for insurance payments for you know, older Americans, regardless of whether or not that money made any sense or did anything to actually fight pandemic. Um, so. There is a, an easy agenda, which is things that I've talked about before, which is policies that combine libertarian methods with progressive goals. And these are things that are fairly easy to, to convince the young as being relatively sensible. So there is a whole YIMBY movement now, which I'm, I'm thrilled by, that actually thinks that actually saying yes in my backyard is actually a good thing. And we actually want to have more permitting to make things happen. Right? We need an equivalent movement around entrepreneurship. We need to get the, the young exercised about the fact that it is so difficult for poor entrepreneurs to get their businesses started, right? particularly the entrepreneurs who create the experiences that is the stuff of urban life, the cafes, the restaurants, the shops. Um, but for p policing and schools, there is no libertarian solution. These are governmental entities. They need bureaucratic reform. With schooling, the problem is longstanding dysfunction, right, which we're all fully aware of. And we've got to recognize that much of this thing can happen around schools, but we've got to take on this fight. With policing, the problem is preserving the critical gains of the last 30 years while still reducing the rage, while still creating less, less anger. And I will just talk about two ideas, which are an Apollo program for American education, which emphasizes the humility to learn, which has to be at the start of any major bureaucratic reform, and uh, what I call Peter Drucker meets Ray Kelly. What gets measured gets managed. Um, so just in, in the housing el element, I, I think this is easy. I think we just keep on repeating that there is a need for progressive libertarianism. Right? This means you know, liberalizing construction is one example of limiting the reach of government to help the poor, something that you know, Andrew Jackson would have understood. Right? This is a um, fast tracking permitting for urban entrepreneurs. Um, there are some areas, and in the book I grapple with this, because, uh, I, and I did this for many reasons. I tell the story of the three strikes rules. And this is particularly associated to an awful murder of a young woman called Diane Balasiotes, who was killed by a guy called Gene Kane, who is a, clearly a, you know, a sexually, uh, sexually violent sociopath who never should have been on a work release program when he killed her. Right? And so it's a, it's a clear case in which the, the woman's mother totally understandably is outraged and leads a national crusade for three strikes rules. 
Now, at the same time, I have to say that being, you know, thinking that you want Gene Keynes to be locked up forever and thinking that you want every three-time marijuana dealer to be locked up forever, those are not the same things, right? And you really do want a prison system that is smarter, I think, than the current system that we, that we have. So uh, one that it does, in fact, punish and incapacitate where it needs to, but one that actually is actually smart about, about figuring out how to, how to do that in a, in a reasonable way. Um, but you also need management. And so I'm going to talk first about schooling. And uh, I have been at the edges of the school reform movements for the last 20 years. Right? I can remember uh, uh, you know, I spent 10 years on the advisory panel for the Gates, the Gates Foundation. And there have been two major attempts in our lifetimes to create a federal change to education, both No Child Left Behind and the Race to the Top, both of which, to a first order approximation, are failures, right? in the sense that they did not fix our underperforming schools. Um, part of that was you know, this, this you know, overconfidence, the hubris in the case of, of Race to the Top, the sense that you know, we knew the answer and it was Common Core. Well, we didn't know the answer. It wasn't Common Core, and this just came out of making it up, right? And then it was imposed on a national level in a completely haphazard and essentially incompetent bureaucratic manner, okay? This is bad bureaucracy. This is what happens when governments you know, don't take this seriously. In the case of schooling, we have to recognize that we don't know the answer, and, but that's okay. We had an Apollo program and we didn't know how to get to the moon either. We started a moon program without any idea of how to send, some, send someone on, onto the moon, and yet we committed significant resources to it. We need to do the same thing in terms of, of schooling. It needs to be national, it needs to be focused on particularly poor kids, and I think it should be focused on vocational skills as well. Ideally, probably wrap around existing educational options, so after school, at, uh, on the weekends, on summers, but I don't know that that's the right answer. I know that we need to be experimenting with a lot of things. Things that work, you scale up. Things that don't work, you reduce back. But it's something that is absolutely vital for the future of our country. Kids, poor kids have to have a sense that they have a stake in the American dream, which means they're being taught skills that actually have value. This is only going to come out of institutions like MI in terms of plans for this, because it's not going to be come from, from people who just say, let's just pay our public schools more. That's not going to be an answer for anything. And I at least have lost some confidence in the ability of charter schools to actually manage to make things work because of opposition to the teachers' unions, because it's been so difficult to expand. And so as much as I am, you know, I'm 100% there with those who would fight for more charter schools, I think we also have to think about things that actually avoid those battles and actually give us other opportunities to, to, to invest. So that's one example. Cops are different. So there is a, you know, uh, as we know, the police, our police are absolutely vital. Our public safety is absolutely vital. And yet we have heard over the past year, year and a half, enormous calls for defunding the police. This is a stupid, stupid line, as everyone here knows, right? This is something that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But we do know that there are large numbers of people who are deeply unhappy with the policing that they've received in many ways, right? That deserves some degree of attention. And at the very least, we need to have policies that respond to that. Now, if you want to have police that have a, you know, that do two things, that provide safety and also do, do more in providing respect for ordinary people, then you need to measure both of those things. Peter Drucker taught us that, right? And so if you're going to have a police system that's changed, then you're going to need to set, put incentives in place for the police chief to actually do that. And the one thing we learned from the tenure of Ray Kelly and from Bratton and from police chiefs all over this country is that the DNA of our police are in the Roman legions. If you have someone at the top who wants to change it, it will change, right? Ray Kelly was able to shape the police in his, you know, in the image that he wanted. And remember, at his height, he was the most popular man in New York, okay? This was no sense in which he was off on some rogue mission doing things that citizens didn't want him to do. He was doing exactly what he was being told to do and doing it very, very effectively. However, it seems to be not what our citizens want right now, but the lesson of the past 30 years is that the police force can change. And so if they want something else, then we need to create incentives for them to do so. So this means something that involves measuring, this involves getting some degree of citizen satisfaction with their police, and then you know, doing some tweaks around the edges to make sure they're delivering that. I have no doubt that the police are capable of doing this. But in policing, as in everything else, right, what, you know, if you want the police to do more, you need to pay more. And so you need to actually expect to spend more on police, not less on police. And I will say, I am open to the possibility, you know, that the defund the police's most reasonable version is maybe some police services can be done by non-police, non-armed police policemen. 
it's a reasonable thing to say we want to experiment with this. But I want to right now put a caution against this out of you know, years, if not uh, of actually over a decade of conversation with uh, Boston's former police commissioner, Ed Davis. So Ed Davis, who was a paragon of leadership on community policing, would tell you the way you build trust between the community and the police force is, in fact, by doing those ordinary things with the police is by bringing them to situations in which they're not violent encounters. And if the only time the police get involved is when there's violence, the police turn into gladiators. They turn into people who don't have those soft social skills to actually connect with ordinary people. And so I think it's, it's potentially worth experimenting with, but I worry a lot about the downsides of this. And I think there's a lot more to be gained by you know, telling police chiefs to figure it out than trying to tell police chiefs that we know what the answer is. But we need to sort of give them, if we want them to have different incentives than just minimizing uh, reported crimes, we need to give them those, those different incentives. So we stand at a dangerous moment. We stand at a moment in which murder has soared, in which there is a huge amount of anger on the part of the left, in which inequalities have been exacerbated by a pandemic. Okay? And Yet, you know, we, we can't fix everything. We know that the, the rich and businesses are mobile. So we need to be smarter. We need to be more effective. Our cities need this. And if you go back to the 19th century, and this is in the third, this is in the third chapter of our book, in some sense, the 19th century is a period in which New Yorkers came together and they figured out how to fix pandemic in their age. New Yorkers like Stephen Allen and uh, Dr. Stephen Smith, founder of the, man who ended up leading the Board of Health. They did so because they were concerned ordinary urbanites who thought their government was screwing up. Right? They thought there were problems that actually needed mature answers, mature answers based on science, and they got engaged. And this was in some sense the hinge of history, where if you think about governments prior to 1800, pretty much all they ever did was kill people. Right? That's basically all that 18th century governments did. In the 19th century, there's this amazing period in which governments actually start saving lives. They do so by building aqueducts, by building sewers, and it happens in New York in a major way. And indeed, this is what stands at the crossroads, is the question as to whether or not our governments will what yet again become pragmatic agents that actually protect people's lives and actually give them policing that's effective, or whether or not we will be carried away on the flotsam of jetsam of progressive dreams that are utterly unmoored from the realities of managing a city. And so that's the final culmination of this, that in fact, this is an important moment. It's an important moment for New York. It's an important moment for every city. And it must be fought with the belief in freedom, the belief in effective management, and the belief in cities to survive and thrive if they get the governments they need, which requires the citizens that they need to actually lead and direct those, those governments. And so I cannot think of a better place to do that than the Manhattan Institute, which has been providing guidance for New York for over 30 years and doing it spectacularly well. And so I'm just excited to see where MI takes, takes us during the Adams administration. And I'm open for questions. Thank you. Yes, go hey, ahead. Thank you, Ed. Uh, by the way, uh, raise your hand for a question. Ed will call on you. And a microphone will also come to you as well. I believe we have microphones in the audience. Uh, yeah, just wait for it to come. Because uh, we we're recording this. We want to make sure that we capture your question. We have a... Yeah, Aaron will bring it to you. Great. <laughs> Good talk. <clears throat> Good talk. I'm Michael Myers. I'm the president of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. Hi. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> <laughs> got to turn up my voice. Um, my question to you relates to uh, a question that Bill Tatum, I don't know if you remember him, he had a question for New York, for the nation, really. And that is, how do you save a city? What's his question? We have homelessness now, which we, what we have now is quite different from what he was talking about. But we have homelessness that is really out of control. We have prison doors that have been opened and people coming back to the cities, sleeping on the streets, not having jobs, committing crimes. We have a housing situation where people can't afford to live in the city anymore. People are moving to Florida and other places. So uh, how do you save a city with crime out of control, with housing unaffordable, with people leaving the city and the homeless sitting in the streets and living in the streets? You, you save it with a police force that is empowered and well incentivized. You save it by building homes that provide more affordable space for ordinary people. 
You do it with the tools that governments have been doing it for the past 200 years, but you make them better for the 21st century. Homelessness itself is particularly fraught. And I would say in terms of all the problems that you have, I think homelessness is the one that I, I'm least sure. But you know, this is exactly the thing that we face, face with each other. But we, and we cannot kid ourselves right, that there is just an answer which is to shrink government. There are some ways in which, some places in which we can shrink government, but you can't shrink government if safety is on the line. Right? So you actually do need an effective, an effective government to deal with these, with these issues. And hopefully the Adams administration will, will give us a bit of this. But um, we shall see. Uh, we shall see. Um, Lawrence, you had your hand up earlier. Um, my view of the education problem is quite different. I don't think we need an Apollo program. I think we actually know how to fix the schools. We need much more intensive schools that reach children at a very young age and show them the possibility of learning and achieving anything. They are, in effect, reparenting the students from coming from very weak families. And th the intensity and insistentness of this model is shown by the most high-performing charter schools. They're not typical of charter schools. The hard thing is to expand the optimal model to include all the schools. For that, you need much more dedicated teachers and principals than we have. So it isn't really a knowledge problem. You have to break the teacher unions who are interested in jobs and not in intensive interaction with the students and replace those teachers with other teachers that are willing to put in the very, very special effort required to reach these difficult children. That's what it takes, and it can be done, as we see in the success sequence, success schools in New York, also the uh, knowledge is power system. These, these, student, these schools have been shown to be successful in rigorous evaluations. So we already know how to do it. The problem is do it on a larger scale. I, I do not disagree with that, except for the fact that I have spent, you know, we've spent 20 years observing the teachers union break everyone who has tried to do anything like this. Okay, so the bottom line is that reformers tend to have relatively short attention spans and teachers unions live forever, forever, okay? And no, it's not hopeless, but it requires a workaround. We, need to, we have been running at the, this brick wall of the teachers union for two decades and getting our head repeatedly smashed into the, into the bricks, right? I'm not against taking another run at it, but we should at least be realistically about what to expect when we do it, okay? So the idea is, to try to do something that works around it, that doesn't touch their jobs, that doesn't make it seem as if that's at risk, that provides something they're not currently providing. And the beauty of a, of a vocational pro program is you actually know what the school is trying to do so you can have pay for performance. You can have it competitively provided by you know, the trade unions, by for-profit companies, by community colleges, and you don't have to pay them if they don't know how to do plumbing or programming when you're done. Right, so you can actually have a full-scale market, market intervention. I am not against pushing on any of these things. But you know, don't tell me the only thing I can do is to keep on running my head against a brick wall. It hurts too much. Uh, they were implicit in everything. They're, they're, they're always on the, I mean, there's no educational issue that does not reflect them. Yes? Is there a large urban public school system in the United States that's performing effectively? And if there is, uh, what are they doing differently? That's a great question. Um, so typically, the, the schools in the sort of I mean, large ones, it's very hard to see anything. I mean, in large ones, it's not, it's not like, I mean, Chicago has made epsilon reforms over the past 10 years, and it looks a little bit less of a disaster than it did 20 years ago. And we're sort of relatively, uh, you know, the Chicago reform was to focus more on just making sure, telling the teachers to make sure the students actually showed up. So it was, it was to, it, you know, it was getting them away from sort of things they didn't understand, which is how to boost test scores and say, just, just get the kids to show up in class. And it turned out that was a really important reform for this. So you're working on a really low base on this. What Lauren said is right about, you know, pre-K programs, but of course the, the impact of Perry Preschool or the Absidarian program from the 1960s, which are small, highly intensive programs, doesn't duplicate well on a national level. And that's part of the issue, right? I mean, Head Start is not a useless program, but it certainly is a pale shadow of Perry Preschool in terms of what it's, what it's achieved. And bringing anything to scale makes things very hard. I mean, we know what our most successful school systems are. They tend to be relatively boutique suburban school systems with lots of involved parents who are willing to supplement the schools really well. You also don't have the problem that the teachers union is a huge fraction of the voters 
in different areas, right? Part of the beauty of these suburban school districts is, in fact, they've got a, you know, you don't have the teachers who are bargaining with the teachers, which is part of the problem of our, of our current setting, right? So there's just a, a, it's a very difficult setting to actually to, to make right. And it is crucial, but if we want to take national action, so I think of this as two different things. So as, an, as a New Yorker, as a Bostonian, it is totally reasonable to fight for things on your local school district. I think it is, it is almost impossible to imagine a national thing like that working. I mean, a, the federal government is just not set up to do that. What the federal government can do is it can do things that wrap around. So it can do things that are, you know, and so that's, that's where the Apollo program comes from. So it's not that I disagree with anything that he said, but I don't think we know what, what works in the realm of the feasible. It's not that I don't think we know what works in the realm of the infeasible. I think we do know what works in the realm of the infeasible, but that, that's not that helpful to me. So, um, yes. Either way, it's just great to see you. My name is Hank Salzow. New York, New York City has, in my mind, a problem that's enormously difficult to overcome. De Blasio got elected with what percentage of the population? And <laughs> basically, okay, basically, uh, the person that wins the Democratic nomination is going to be the mayor. And how we overcome that when you have parents who are wildly upset with their school system but really don't vote. On the other hand, everybody working for the city votes. Every teacher votes. And we have enormous apathy in respect to the rest of the population and probably because they just look at it and say it's hopeless because look who's running. That, that to me is, is the enormous challenge for going forward as a city. It's, uh, it's right uh, as a diagnosis of things. I, I will say things don't look very different in Boston, which has a nonpartisan uh, electoral process, right? So they have a runoff and they go down to two. So it's not like I put very little stock in the idea that sort of political changes are going to make much of a difference, right? In fact, if anything, the, the Boston, the, the leading Boston candidate seems significantly farther to the left relative to where Adams, uh, Adams is. Um, the power of, you know, local unions uh, is distinctly weaker in the right to work states or in states that actually don't allow these unions to, to strike. Um, I am not particularly you know, uh, optimistic on the view that New York would do something like that, but um, there are ways we know of, of limiting the power of local unions and, and particularly southern states have done that. Um, but um, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's you're, what you're describing is in some sense my answer to Lawrence's question, which is that I, I don't see something that works you know, that tries to break the power of the unions as being an easy thing to do at all. It's just sort of politically impossible. You know, again, there's more attention to safety. And it's, it's uh, you know, when the city starts getting unsafe, I think voters really do vote on that. Whereas, in fact, the, the teachers union is, is just harder. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Ian Hyatt. Thank you for your, for your talk tonight. Thank um, you. Leadership matters. And uh, when you compare the NYPD under Jimmy O'Neill and the NYPD under Dermot Shea, both of them are very strong, lifelong uh, police officers, the biggest difference is systemic. It's bail reform. Dermot Shea has dealt with the pandemic. He's dealt with George Floyd. He's dealt with defund the police. But when you look at the crime stats in New York City, it's systemic. It's that there are state laws that, were, that have been drafted that do not allow the NYPD to do their jobs. And it, it, I, I, you made a point in your presentation that, you know, okay, Ray Kelly did this and you know, Bratton did mm -hmm. that. I, I, I think there's more, th there's more nuance there. Well, I, I don't, I, I, there's plenty of, there's plenty of nuance. I certainly, I certainly agree with that. There's plenty of nuance there. And um, that's exactly what we're fighting against, right? We're trying to make sure that the police are able to do their job in a way that, you know, the police chief finds acceptable, right? And so the goal here is to, is to stop sort of blunt things which say, oh, you know, we're going to let everyone out immediately. We're going we're gonna to stop you from locking people up, which comes out of the anger, right? It comes out of the rage. It comes out of this sense which, you know, this craziness on the left that, like, our biggest problem in, the, in cities is police abuse, right? This is a ubiquitous view among 19-year-olds who are, who are left. That's the big problem, right? 
that's not the big problem, obviously, but it leads to policies like the ones that you're talking about. And the goal is to give, there has to be an alternative, right, um, that actually tries to accomplish some of what they're doing, but does so in a way that doesn't put public safety at risk. And so that's in some sense the goal here, is to not, is to not treat it as if, you know, I, I believe very strongly, partially because I, you know, I, I live at Harvard, but the view that just says, oh, you're wrong, and we're not going to do anything about this, and let's just let the police do what, what they used to do, that's not a view that gets us very far. Right? That's, that's a view, even if it in some sense has a lot to recommend itself. But it needs a, you know, at least I feel the need to do a response, given, you know, given the George Floyd protests, given everything that we saw, and I think pushing on you know, measurement and pushing on delivering what many people would, real, would agree is sort of a reasonable expectation feels a lot better than saying, oh, we're not going to let you lock up anyone anymore. That's, that's where I am on this. Um, yes, ma'am. Dorothy Schultz, I'm a retired Metro North commuter railroad police captain. I was a commanding officer at Grand Central Terminal. Thank you, Home thank you for your service. Okay, thank you. But the point is that the homeless crisis, quote unquote, has been going on since the 1980s at least. When I was the CEO at Grand Central, all the transportation facilities were overrun with homeless people. There is nothing new about this. We had meetings with social workers, and their answer was, why can't you put them in what used to be drunk tanks <laughs> and drive them out of the city? So this whole idea that social workers are going to deal with the homeless is absurd. They're going to deal with them for a week, and when they come in from midnight to 8, and they're spit at and pissed on and vomited on, they will not show up. That is not what they went to get MSWs in social work in. It's absurd. And the, the system, what has made this more apparent is to a large extent COVID because there are fewer people out in the street, there are fewer people in the transportation facilities, and so the homeless people and those with serious mental illnesses who were not treated have gotten uh, worse and far more obvious. But the solution, this is not a crisis from yesterday. This is a crisis from at least the 1980s. We would see them in Grand Central and say, why don't you go to Penn Station? <laughs> and so that's say, the solution. That, that, was, the that solution. was the solution. Well, because there was nothing else you could do with them. Yeah. And they would tell you, we just came from there. They told us to come here. And I am not making this up. These are true stories. It was like a circuit from Port Authority, Port Authority at the bus terminal. They were ordered by some judge to put up cots. So that became an overnight lodging. When they got tired of being there, they came around. I don't want to take up more time. I just want to reassure you that this is not a problem from yesterday or today. It's a problem of at least 40 years, and it has to do a lot with the deinstitutionalization uh, of the mentally ill. So I will say, so that's a great comment. That's a great comment, absolutely. So there were, there were two great schools, and both have a lot of truth in it, from the early 1990s of, of researchers who were doing, doing on that. So uh, the, one of the two great books on this was by Christopher Jenks, Sandy Jenks, which was very focused on the deinstitutionalization, as you said, which I think is, is probably the most likely explanation uh, of it. There's another view which I want to highlight, though, which Dan O'Flaherty of Columbia emphasized, which is um, shutting down the single room occupancies the SROs, right? So essentially, well-meaning housing reformers essentially eliminated a key part of the housing stock which used to cater to people on the edges. And by, in some sense, over-regulating that part of the market, you pushed people out into the streets. That's, I think, less important than the deinstitutionalization, but they're both, they're both there uh, going forward. And I will say the one thing that's really critical on, on the homelessness, I, I don't know, I, I really don't have a long-run solution for this, but one thing I do believe very strongly is they cannot be allowed to destroy our core public spaces. Right, so you know whatever we think is the long run solution for them in terms of some combination of humanity and some other thing, I don't know. But I do know that if you know Grand Central Station becomes essentially unusable, right? If Penn Station becomes unusable, if our parks become places of horror rather than places of pleasure, that is not an acceptable thing. And wherever they're moved, they need to be not shuffled around between core core nodes in our transportation network. A lot right. of the solutions were to make it less amenable uh, to other people. So Yep. Uh, ben, put studs in the benches, right? To, uh, yeah. 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 Did you? Okay. Yeah. Great. 
the cops got much more effective. And they increased, the, the increased cop spending, spending on police very significantly. That started under Dinkins, right? That started on, under, under uh, uh, but you know, it was really under the Giuliani era where, where you know, a massive increase in the number of cops is typically given as the primary explanation of what's going on. You, sir. Yeah, Stephen Hyde, Manhattan Institute. I want to ask you about demographic change in cities. You didn't talk about this very much, but in the Boston area, there are a number of colleges now that are very worried about enrollment trends. Um, and this is really going to come up, come up against this, uh, the colleges and also the cities in the next 10 years, I mean, relatively soon. If colleges are concerned, don't you think cities should be as well? And what are we, what is that going to look like? So I don't think so. I don't think the problem is the, is the young. There, there are a bunch of Boston colleges that are very expensive relative to their product, right? And I think that's, that's a core issue. But no, if anything, I think that the, that, you know, the, the continuing allure of being in a city for like young kids, that's not going to go away. Uh, that's not going to, you know, you're not, you're not going to have 22-year-olds who stop to think it's fun to be where there are 22-year-olds of, you know, of potentially dating, dating material. Of course, to get there, cities are going to have to become cheaper. And we've be, been in this sort of weird, weird world where despite the fact that, you know, Manhattan having empty offices and often empty apartments, right, prices have gone up rather than down in terms of the residential, not in terms of commercial. That's not a long-run equilibrium outcome. And so if you think that we're going to have a substantial drop in demand for commercial real estate, what that's going to show up in New York is not long-run vacancies. It's going to show up in lower prices, right? And as you get lower prices, you'll see the replacement of older firms with younger firms. Um, and I think that's likely to be true in the residential market as well, where you know, when every 19-year-old I see around me, and I see a lot of them, right, they are so happy to be back in person and back connected with each other, right? Whereas I know a lot of 55-year-olds who have said, you know, Phoenix, Arizona is looking pretty good for me right now, and I'm really going to stay there and, and zoom it in. I think, in fact, this is, you know, the most likely event is not an aging of New York, but actually a, a younger, scrappier New York, at least if there is some, you know, space to occupy them, at least if we don't, you know, create a rent control that protects everything. Um, someone over here had their, had their hand up who wasn't. Yes, sir. And then I'll get to this, this side. Uh, thank you, Emil Ark. I very much enjoyed the lecture. Uh, I was curious about your very last slide uh, where you talked about uh, measuring uh, police courtesy so that uh, it could be rewarded. It's hard to think of anyone objecting to that in principle, but I'm wondering what that means because when I think of the analogs, the, the front desk at the Marriott, the uh, Yaffe <coughs> review of your local restaurant, there's a, um, there's a mechanism for doing that. And in those contexts, there are actually no trade-offs because it's an analoid good for the front desk at the Marriott to be courteous. Uh, policing, I think, operates in a world where there are a range of outcomes and potential trade-offs on that spectrum in terms of um, what you measure. So. Uh, it sounds like a great goal, but I'm wondering how it's implemented in the real world. Thank you. So the, 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 this is a fundamental problem of bureaucracy, which James Q. Wilson highlighted, right? When companies fail, it's immediately obvious because people stop buying their stuff, right? And so if you're producing a crappy product, right, you're going to be out of business pretty quickly. If you're a failing bureaucracy, you can stay on for decades, right, continuing to do your thing in a completely mediocre and worthless manner. Right. So in some cases, we do have some kind of measures, although the fact that we have, in the cases of schools and cops, we actually do have measures. They just don't seem to be having that much of it. I mean, they are having an effect in, in policing. They don't have, seem to have much of an effect in terms of schools. Um, but we should think more about measurement in terms of other government functions. Now, if you were going to do it with some kind of a survey route, it would have to be independent of the police, ideally independent of the mayor's office entirely. You'd have to have some form of random survey uh, methodology, and you'd actually figure out what people are, are, you know, what their experiences have been. It's not particularly hard to do this. It's not particularly expensive to do this. Um, but, you know, voters would have to decide what they actually wanted from their police, right? This is not my job to tell them what they're, you know, I was actually feeling pretty good about what the police were delivering to me. I'm not, I'm not part of the, I'm not part of the, the, the I've not experienced any of the, of the rage that, uh, Many people are. So, you know, we need to figure out what, you know, if, they, if they've got a problem, they need to actually be able to articulate it and then ask what, you know, what would measure it and what will make it better, right? That's, that's a useful thing. This type of measurement can be used in lots of different elements. I mean, asking people regularly in the city about what things that they are liking or not liking about what government is doing is a perfectly sensible thing to do. And again, it's not an expensive thing to do at all. It's a, it's a perfectly reasonable thing. And yet, I think in some sense, the reason we don't do it is governments actually don't want to hear that their citizens are unhappy with their stuff. 
right? They actually don't want, li like living in a regime of ignorance uh, from this, and they don't like people knowing that other people are also unhappy with the way that they're being treated. And so I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask this about a range of government services. Are you happy with the DMV, right? Are you happy with uh, various other services? So, you know, some, something like that is sort of seems to me like a useful thing to do. Let's go over to this side. Oh, you, you there, sir. Uh, hi. Um, so, so enjoy the, the presentation. Um, so I want to uh, go off of the macro questions, you know, on demographics and all that. How do you think, since you're an economist, how do you think um, macroeconomic and global trends affect the problems of, of cities? Um, uh, for example, um, I, I think the two I, I would point to would be one is inequality and the second is um, uh, technological, uh, you know, change. So. Uh, inequality is is very easy. You know, you're seeing a lot of cities, you know, housing prices are unaffordable, like San Francisco, New York, some of these places for for average people. Uh, the second would be um, technological change. Um, entities like Facebook, you know, is that uh, they seem to be causing more polarization, more self segregation. Uh, do you think they affect the problem of cities? Uh, it's not obvious that the on, I mean, typically people in terms of their online media experience actually experience a more integrated, a, a more diverse view than they actually do offline. So it's not, it's not totally clear that that's making things worse. I thought you were going the other direction, which is the extent to which the technologies that enable us to go remotely are causing a problem for cities, which is, is you know, that's, that, you know, uh, the person who I associate that view most strongly with was Alvin Toffer in the third wave, who predicted in 1980 that the ability to connect uh, electronically would mean that face-to-face -face contact in the cities and offices that abet that contact would become largely obsolete. Now, for 39 years, Toffer was completely and totally wrong. Right? Because, in fact, cities managed to survive and thrive despite the existence of these technologies, in part because he forgot the fact that what these technologies were doing was they were radically increasing the returns to being smart. And that's the upside of your inequality. And it turns out that we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. This is what cities do. And there is not only a huge amount of quantitative evidence on this, this is something I think everyone here who has worked in an urban environment has experienced. The fact that you were surrounded by smart people has actually helped you to you know, figure out how to do your, do your job more effectively. I, I don't think Zoom in any sense eliminates that. It just, just provides a hiccup in it. And certainly, you know, we have seen, for, so just to give you a little bit of evidence on this, so for doing static jobs, right, going remote is perfectly productive. So there's a great paper by Stanford economist Nick Bloom from 2015, and a more recent paper by Harvard uh, PhD students Natalia Emanuel and Emma Harrington that look at call center workers. And they show that when you send people home, right, in call centers, they can do those calls just as well as when they're, on, when they're in the office. But their probability of being promoted drops by over 50%. Right? And what does promoted mean in a call center worker? You get to handle the real pains in the neck. Right? You get to handle the people who really won't shut up. Now, how would you learn how to handle those people if you were all by yourself? How would your boss know that you were any good at handling them if your boss never saw you? Right? And so it's this information-rich environment that is you know, face-to-face -face learning. It's, it's what you see in trading floors that is you know, more valuable. And I think fundamentally, when it's, you know, when it's OK to be, you know, when it's safe to be together, the offices will, in fact, come back, uh, although they may have slightly different firms. They may be younger, scrappier, more information-intensive firms. And I will just say teaching, right? Like, I can maintain existing relationships over Zoom, and it's fine. But like, you know, uh, inspiring 19-year-olds to get excited about mathematical economics over Zoom, it's just awful, right? It just doesn't work. So I, 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 think, I think living live is still going to go, OK. Uh, yes, go, go ahead. How would you evaluate the concept of school choice as a possible solution for the crisis in our educational system? I, I have always been, uh, you know, a supporter of giving people more options. I mean, in almost every dimension. I mean, I think competition is good for schools as it is for almost everything else. And you know, it's it's a a terrible thing that cities, which are so, you know. The ability to have competition is one of the greatest things about cities, right? We have great restaurants and great stores in cities precisely because it is a furious competition between these things. And yet, in the most important thing that cities do, which is to create opportunity for our kids, we handed it over to an awful state monopoly. And we said, you know, no competition, no innovation, no, you know, we're just going to follow this sort of bureaucratic rule. I would love to see more competition in this. I would love to see more choice. I would love to see more charter schools. I would love to see things that look like vouchers. I would love to see more choice across districts, right? All of these things I would love to see, right? But there's all that stuff that we're talking about, right? The empowered teachers' unions, the empowered whatever. So I am with you. If you, want it, you know, if you want me to fight with you on that, I'm happy to do that. But I'm tired of running at that brick wall. 
right? And so I think it's important to give people things that are choices outside of school that are less likely to conflict with the teachers' union. And that's the point about these sort of vocational programs. You're not making anyone do it. You're giving people those options. You're allowing competition. You're having pay for performance. And you're getting at least some wedge of it in through the side door without actually running into the teachers' union brick wall. Right? So that's, that's, that's where I am. And you know, there are times in which the answer is, oh, you just need to get tougher. I, you know, I've been having these conversations for 20 years with a lot of people who've been, you know, all we need to do is get tougher, and every time they get rolled. Right? And you, know, you don't need to go, you don't need to think about, since, since Esther Shields, she'll remember the, you know, this in the lore of urban government. What happened to John Lindsay when he said he was going to get tough with Mike Quill? Right? This is a legendary moment in city government. John Lindsay, he's a tough guy. He's going to come in. He's going to make those transit workers roll over. Boom! Mike Quill rolled him over in a millisecond. Right? And so, what? He did eventually, but he first, I mean, the, the, uh, the, um, the second one. No, not in the, not in the, set, not in the 65 strike. Yeah, eventually, but not in the. <laughs> the, um, the the point is, in, the, the the point is that in fact competition is in fact a very good thing, and we need to fight to get more of it. But we need to be smart about way, the way that we get it, and that's that's what I'm saying on this. Well, thank. Um, I think I'm I'm done. Am I done, Michael? Can I call? You're done. I, I'm I'm so glad that there are more questions. Ed, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. 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 Ed, thank, thank you, and, and thanks to everyone who's, who's here. We're going to be continuing to meet in person because we believe that is valuable. That's part of the magic of cities. We get to come face to face. We're going to have a, more events coming up. Uh, next up with senior fellow Chris Rufo. Next week, our New York City Reborn Summit. Please register. Go on our website. Please come. We want to see you. Ed, again, thank you so much. Thank you, and have a great evening.